Hello, audience, oh. both of you. <laughs> Hello, um, and welcome to the Delinquent Data Podcast with your hosts, us Flor. There, we've got the opener. Sweet. <laughs> do rightly. Do rightly. DFR. That's it. So, do we have a theme for tonight? Apart from, you know, us three are dickheads and we're going to talk shit. I think that's the general theme anyway, isn't it? The same thing we do every night, Pinky. I don't think there's been anything. I mean, I think we did have a previously arranged one and we had cooked it down the can a couple of times. And it's that typical thing of we've slightly drifted away from temporal relevancy. So what what is AI fucked up for us this month? You know, got- actually, Jason, you made a good point earlier. <clears throat> and I actually, I think this is a good one to get into. And it's around AI ethics. And the fact that AI ethics, and Jason, I'm totally stealing in your wording, it's beautiful. This is like the new social media influencer is an AI ethics expert. I've seen more crop up in the last three days that everyone's suddenly, oh, 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 oh yeah, mm, yeah. Mm. Excuse me, I've been on the, I've, I've been on the, the, the P74 or 7014 working group for a year and I've been sitting there kind of going, this is all fairly esoteric to say the least but I mean there is this sort of glut of it's mostly from what I can see so far and I'm probably going to get in trouble with the working group for this one but an awful lot of uh, 30 years ago there would be philosophy grads it's just that this is the how do you how do you how do you critique the way the system works whenever you don't need to know anything about the system so, so if, if we actually do have an audience, Bolster is referring to the fact <laughs> that he's in an IEEE working group looking at ethics in, in empathic intelligence or emp- empathic ethics, intelligence, all sorts of <laughs> complex stuff. It, yeah, right. uh, standards for empathic technology that then also include ethical explainability of that empathic technology. All gets confusing. Feature yeah. creep so, all over the place. Yeah. yeah. The thing I liked about your point, Jess, is that this has become like a social media influencer thing. Mm-hmm. I will state my position on this, right? I'm really interested in philosophy. I'm a philosophy dork, nerd type, and I'm vaguely aware of AI. So my interest in AI ethics, I, I quite honestly am interested philosophically in AI ethics. But I see huge amounts of discussion around AI ethics that honestly seems completely meaningless. Yeah. Yep. Oh, well, I mean, right, yeah, we do. <laughs> that was a fucking short podcast. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Woohoo! I mean, the, from my perspective, the, there are a couple of levels in this because so my research background drifted into using research into sociology and applying it to autonomous systems. So that's not AI ethics. It's also not autonomous sociology either. It's stealing or, you know, you know, we were looking for a, a good pattern that we could model that lowers the information density of a community of humans. If we can take those structures and go, okay, switch out the talkie talkie and the faces and the flags and everything like that, switch that for some other kind of technical identifier that we can then use to literally optimize the communications of a network. Because whenever we talk about how we trust each other or what the definition of a community is, it's generally a load of communication shortcuts. It's what color is your skin? What style is your hair? What shape is your face? What accent do you speak with? There are ways of saying, are you part of my party? Yeah. Are you bald? Do you have a beard? Yeah. Do we have some kind of commonality that can either be a shortcut to, I know that you have some set of shared values with me, or it's, or the art group assessment of going, uh, oh, no, he, he's got a Spurs top. I'm not going to get along with him. Um, or in our case, Jace is clearly the, the art group. Uh, it's, well, you, you can never get rid you of the English. Hair no, you have hair and no beard, Jace. <laughs> Your hair is in the wrong place. It's upside down. It is upside down, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it had, it had an escape my notice. 
But I mean, just, um, to, just to finish up that point, I mean, there was a talk that I gave to, as part of NIDC, as part of Raspberry Jam, as part of Kuro Dojo, which was talking about robot psychiatry. And it's my, my favorite subject because it's completely made up, or it was completely made up until a couple of years ago, where then somebody started using it. But it's this idea that was coined by Isaac Asimov in Liar, I think which was a short story that was basically around this idea of an intelligent system, a robot, that I think, if I remember correctly, it learned how to lie, but the, the, the story was quite entertaining because the way it manifested this lying was to tell people what they wanted to hear. So it was actually, sorry, that was it. It was telepathic. It was a telepathic robot. It could read your mind and then it told you what you wanted to hear. Your de deepest, darkest desires and just said that that's what was happening. So it was lying to you. But the ethics of whether you want that system to lie or not is s s somewhere in this boundary between the technical side of how do you literally get the bits and bytes to flow the way you want to versus how do you assess the complex meta structure of cognition uh, to convince, to explain to this created machine? It doesn't matter whether it's an artificial intelligence or a biological one. You still need to be able to explain to it the thing that you're doing. I understand why you think it makes sense, but it's wrong. That's basically what psychiatry is or cognitive behavioral therapy or whatever way you want to look at it. And I think that's a much more interesting area than just going, oh, I'm, I do AI ethics. Uh, yeah, okay. I, the thing is what you just said, that idea of, you know, the, the robo psychiatrist that just tells you what it thinks that you want to hear. I mean, is that, did you not just describe Facebook? <laughs> No, sorry, to be clear, the robo-psychiatrist was, I keep forgetting her name and it's really annoying, was the human character in the story who, that was her job role, was to analyse intelligent systems that had gone awry one way or another. Right. So the liar, I can't remember, again, terrible memory, this is why I have things like Facebook to remember friends, but yeah. So it was a fascinating story and it just led on to a series of this, this overlap between the social and the psychological, which are really just the analysis of complex systems and the technical implementation of those systems. But if we look at AI ethics as being, <clears throat> if it's not a social media influencer trend or, you know, the various other cynical approaches that we can take to this, ethics is a branch of philosophy and a highly complex and important branch of philosophy that I think all three of us are genuinely quite interested in, right? Yeah. And AI ethics is the branch of philosophy that should look at ethics as it applies to artificial intelligence. Have any of you been particularly convinced that any of the people talking about AI ethics are experts in AI or philosophy? Never mind both. Speaking um, as one of them, no. <laughs> no. No. I, this is the thing. I, I've been looking, like, to, to, for the AI and I events, I have been looking for quite a while to get an actual philosopher to come and speak, right? I want to find an actual philosopher who's knowledgeable about AI and AI ethics, and I can't find one. Mm. Honestly, can't find one. So... My beef, and it's my beef on a lot of things actually, it's a lot of in machine learning, big data, and they, you know, AI in general, is it, it's feeling more and more of an academic field and not a practice, not a practitioner's field. Yeah, papers, papers are released. We go read the papers. Well, I don't read them anymore. It's like, oh, it's another one. And they are separating themselves from the real world. In, in a rapid rate of knots and it's it's really really hard to stomach anymore in all fairness i'm getting bored of it because there's no there's no business advancement and that's the interesting thing with tim mcgabrew who got pushed by google it's well this is a business it's a money-making business so yeah. if you're going to start speaking out at it then obviously you're going to get removed you know, but 
I, that's a but that's a really good point, and I, I, I agree with you that we seem to have this bifurcation piece where it is increasingly academic on the one side, but on mm -hmm. then the flip side, it's increasingly just being used by industry and it's just becoming part of what people do, right? Oh but yeah, It'll this is where the AI ethics thing kind of grinds me a little bit because AI ethics seems to be going and siding with exactly what you're saying with that kind of a weird academic tinge, right? Mm -hmm. So of all the academic research going on, which probably has almost no real world application, and then all of the AI ethics is sitting over there with the academics. But where is the AI ethics as it applies to business and the business use of AI? So that's a really good question because I don't actually think it exists because capitalism. Sorry, capitalism. Capitalism yeah. is the answer to all of these questions. It is okay. So take take. Let's take an example. Let's see what I can think of. Actually, no, it's not even that. Okay, so there's a book called Just Business: Business Ethics in Action by Elaine Sternberg. And it's going back a bit now. It might be 97, 98 when this book was out. But within the first chapter, Sternberg lays out what business really is. And it's business is to increase shareholder value over the long term by the selling of business and you know, products and services. Of which Google is a business. Yep. You know, it's there to make money for its shareholders by whatever means, preferably legal. Do not be evil and all that. And I think we've taken this whole do not be evil thing, but it's like at the end of the day, they're a business. You know, if you go back to, here we go, Tesco, it's about behavior change. With all this data, can I make someone change their behavior and buy a different product? Is it ethical? Well, no. Does it happen? You bet it does. Why does it happen? Increase the bottom line. Uh, yeah, so as, as Andrew, just, as Bolster just said, you know, I mean, ultimately it is, yeah, sure, capitalism, yay. Yeah. But, you know, the thing that, that, the reason I was initially, when we had the first wave of AI ethics being a thing that people talked about, and, and I've said this publicly before, you know, one of the things that I like about the whole concept of AI ethics is it introduces the concept of a discussion of ethics into discussions around business and technology, which honestly, I've never really been aware of before. You know, I mean, it, it was driving something that I thought could be hugely beneficial to how we look at ethical approaches to business and how we look at ethical approaches to the application of technology generally, right? And I feel like it's kind of lost its way. You know what I mean? It has. I actually think COVID has a lot to do with it. Everyone was getting really excited when COVID happened and no one mentioned AI afterwards. You know, everyone went back to humanity. Everyone went outside and started walking around trees again, you know, and, and trying to get away from computers, you know, and trying to- Well, well they also ended up having their computer as a, as, a, as a prime mover in the household in a way that hadn't, necessarily been the case for everybody before where you know there, there wasn't a, a meal for the past eight months that hasn't been within camera range of a zoom call you know it, it's the 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 collision between work life and home life i think yeah, i would agree it kind of uh, de-emphasized the ai conversation but ironically enough it effectively put uh how would you put it put the it, it brought it directly to people's homes and it mixed the homework environment in a way that hadn't been done before. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And that's like, I, I was late starting. Well, I, we, I, I live in a weird household, apparently, according to the rest of this nation. So we normally eat dinner at like eight o'clock at night. So I had to rush upstairs to get dinner because I had to get started to come back down here for half seven. So I get off one Zoom call, ran upstairs, got some dinner and have come down to another Zoom call. But as you say, that this has become... The, the, the computers and the, the interface and the constant usage of the technology has become even more pervasive than it ever was under COVID. But I agree with you that if anything during COVID, AI ethics has become this weird sidelined academic thing that yeah. we're writing papers, but I'm not seeing it applied to business 
except for perhaps, well, maybe we should talk about this. I mean, what are your thoughts on the whole thing with Timnit and Google? Well, I haven't, I haven't read the paper, but from the small amount I do know, yes, there's definitely an ethics argument there. But it all comes down to quality of data, you know, right at the start with all this kind of thing. But I, like I say, I've not read it. Actually, I've just got it in front of me on technology review. I've not read it. So I'm not going to go too deep into it. Yes, it's the way it was handled was really bad because certain people didn't even know it was happening. It was just, and then obviously it went through its whole Twitter explosion. There's a shock. And that was the first, and in all fairness, I'd never even heard of Timnit Gebru up until the 2nd of December. I had never heard of her, and indeed, I wasn't even aware of the Twitter chaos that was happening until a friend messaged me on WhatsApp going, are you following this? And, you know, it's, it's one of those weird ones where uh, we're trying to be as objective as possible. A researcher in Google, and again, it does kind of come down to that thing. If, if we put aside any of the identity politics that might be associated with this, it kind of comes back to the point that you made, Jace, that I think this author has worked with other academic colleagues to say things that are not particularly singing the praises of her employer and her employer she no longer works for that employer and it appears to be an example of yay capitalism right so we have a very large one of the largest companies on earth who is committed to ai ethics but when something is done that questions their ethics they want to block that publication. Now it could be we haven't we haven't read I haven't read the final publication. It could be that their complaints are legitimate, but it's it's the optics on this are not good. And as yeah. I say, that if I remove any of the identity politics around this, if we put that back in, then Jesus, this is awful for Google. Well, I mean, you've got to define what awful means for like one of the biggest companies on the planet. It's not exactly like. Google's variance from the original Don't Be Evil slogan is news to anyone. I mean, I, I would argue that if, if to take it back to the capitalism yay argument, you know, that reality is factored in and be that factored into the stock price, factored into the board allocations, factored into anything on that side of things. There's no, I don't think this is a, a traumatic event in any way because if anything, the biggest challenge is that as part of any paper like this, it, it is automatically a blueprint for what's acceptable in the industry. So if Google's doing something that maybe Facebook or Uber or any of the rest of the Fang or whatever the Fang gang is these days, you know, if they go, oh, Google's doing that, that means I can do it too. Or, oh, they decided to not do that. Oh, maybe we should dial that back. I mean, I would agree that the the response hasn't been great, but I, unfortunately, this is just the kind of thing that happens whenever you go against the party line. Yeah, <clears throat> but that's the question. If we say, oh, it's awful for Google, the question is, and again, we take that pure capitalist perspective, does this affect their bottom line? Does this affect their share price? No. no. Does it affect public opinion? No. Not really. It affects a certain sector of the public opinion. It's Does it the, affect it's, the, it's the same as the Ryanair effect. You can have positive or negative PR and it won't make much difference. Well, the, the thing that I would think is that, you know, Google, Google held themselves up as these bastions of, you know, I mean, don't be evil was there right there on their website and they removed that and changed their slogan to being do the right thing. Now, you could be pro Google and say, don't be evil is a negative statement, do the right thing is a positive statement, and therefore that's a positive PR spin. Mm -hmm. But you could also be very cynical and say, do the right thing means make more and more money for Google and don't rock the boat. But is this what, when you bring academia and business together, it is like oil and water. I know Bolster's laughing. When you, mix oil and, when you mix oil and water, it doesn't explode. 
Well, the, the other thing is that if you do it properly, you get mayonnaise. So I, I, I don't think there's any, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's my point. It's, it's more like a match in petrol if you add academia and business a lot of the time, let's be honest. Yeah, well, I, I've got a tough relationship with this one because I personally think that academia is a fantastic driver of innovation and that in an ideal world, the pure whenever i say academic i don't just necessarily mean the operations within academic institutions but i mean the the academic what the fuck do we call it knowledge economy right not just the, oh, oh. i know i know i know no right. the, the that knowledge economy buzzword bingo has always entertained me because uh, I think it's recently been sort of quasi rebranded as the innovation economy or some bullshit. <laughs> that at least implies that there's something that changes. You know, do knowledge economy. Have, do we still have the second fastest growing knowledge economy in the UK? Who's <sighs> we? That's Science Which Park we? slash Catalyst, Catalyst slash Northern Ireland slash the province no, slash. So we mean, so is it Northern Ireland? Is it UK? Is it Northern Ireland? Is it Europe? Right? Oh yeah, we're, are we? Oh, we still part of Europe. Hang on, what day is it? Uh, uh, it's got a few, a few days yet. Yeah. Another couple of days. Cool. So, I, mean, I, I suppose the argument that I'm trying to make is that the, whenever we talk about the innovation economy, the knowledge economy, whatever way you want to talk about it, at some point you have to create new things, and generally those new things don't immediately have a obvious use case. No, I'm not saying a business case. I'm not saying a market plan. I'm saying they literally do not have a clear use case. It generally starts off as, here's this is a cool wee thing, this is funky, or this solves some kind of abstract academic question. That area of the innovation economy, I think we could do with more of, because especially locally, there's an awful lot of navel gazing, and I am cycling it back to the AI ethics discussion. There's an awful lot of navel gazing and regurgitation of the same conversations, and I'm guilty of it as much as anyone else. I, you know, the the talking circuit has effectively turned into a bingo card of going right. When's Jay's going to talk about t Tesco's? When's Bolster going to talk about education data sets being shit? When's he going to, you know, it's there is. I mean. It, also, we were doing the, the UU MSC AI workshop a couple of weeks ago. I had to basically rebuild my talk three times over the course of uh, the session because everyone was talking about the stuff that I had in my sort of headline presentation. I didn't. I didn't touch a thing of yours. Oh, yeah, because I knew what you were going to talk about, so I didn't put it in mine. But... <laughs> I, that, I mean, that, that's the thing, though. That, so that's like, that's an interesting one, right? So both of you did lectures at one of our prestigious local universities, right? Yeah. You guys bring that industry perspective, which I feel sometimes, well, not sometimes, I feel consistently is lacking within academia, right? And I think it's important that people in academia get some kind of insight into industrial industry perspective. But one of the things that kind of bugs me about it a little bit is you're asked to come and do this for no reward, creates a huge amount of work for you. And in fact, the last time I got invited, I literally declined because it would have required me actually driving 60 miles to deliver that lecture, which would have required me to spend at least a day or two preparing to drive 60 miles to deliver a one hour lecture to drive 60 miles home again. And I was like, I'm really sorry. I mean, I really want to contribute, but honestly, you're asking too much. At that time, I was working as a consultant, right? And I literally had to sit down and map out what is the cost to me to do this by not doing other business. And it was just unsustainable for me to do that, right? So, I mean, one of the things that bugs me is the fact that you guys had to put so much time and effort into going in and supporting the universities to give them the bit that they're missing in their perspectives. I don't actually think it's that simple. It's, it's, I don't even think it was that useful for the students, is an honest argument. That, I mean, I, I'm very biased here, but I would much rather operate on a one-to-one -one or a one-to-group conversational classical seminar model 
than having presentations because the irony is now that we're in this lovely COVID situation, everyone's doing remote meetups, everyone's doing remote lectures. And I'm wondering what's the fucking point whenever everybody has access to YouTube. So it's not that you're, the, the, the meetup circuit has kind of fall, fallen back to, oh, we just want to find somebody from somewhere in the world to talk, but we're just using local people. And there's been some of the groups that have taken this brilliantly and gone, right, okay, we are the, you know, Belfast JS user group, whatever, the, whoever it is. And rather than focusing on the Belfast speaker circuit, they're bringing in the international speaker circuit to a Belfast audience. That's fine. But I think it misses the fun discussion, which is what I, what I got whenever I was a student, the most that I got out was whenever I was able to talk to industry experts about, you know, actually being able to talk through a conversation about how I was approaching a problem or get them to talk about their problems and then respond and how I would, you know, would think about it. You know, that, that connect, that, it has to be an actual conversation. It can't just be a, a lecture. Yeah, it's, I mean, I think that's a really interesting thing and it almost raises, and I think, I mean, this is this is a much more sort of broad ranging conversation than anything just to do with data and AI. Yeah. For me, it raises that fundamental question of what is the place of further and higher education as we move forward, right? So I could go, so, well, again, I went to University of Ulster. I did my degree and PhD, at University of Ulster, had a great time, really enjoyed it, great education, no complaints. But if I were to take a step back and say, if I were 19 years old today, but somehow had the world experience that I had now, would I go to university or would I do a bunch of Coursera courses taught by genuine world experts? I would go with the latter, right? I'm going to get a much better education by going to MIT and Harvard and UCLA and all of the folks from there who are genuine world experts. I can listen to, you know, the people who have invented these technologies teaching you about, right? As opposed to somebody who has read about them or, you know, some, some vague awareness of it. So the university, Hang on, that's, that's my career. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know what I mean? I mean, it's, this is the thing when it comes down to teaching and, and the further and higher education establishments role now is it has to be more than just delivering content. It's not just sticking up a bunch of slides. You know, it's it's not just about imparting knowledge because the knowledge is already out there. You know, it's it's no longer something locked in a textbook. There's YouTube videos, there's Coursera, Udemy. You know, I could list you 20 different educational platforms that will give you the same knowledge that you can get from your lecturer. But the point is that the universities have to adapt and change. And they're being, they have to be pushed to that by doing this on by doing this remotely because they're not doing face-to-face -face teaching anyway. So you then have to say, well, what is your value proposition? What is your USP that is different between me paying to do a course in University of Ulster or Queens versus paying significantly less to do a course on Coursera or Udemy? So there's a couple of things in there. The, the easy one that I'll head off first is that we've had this for a while and it's called the Open University. And OU has been much maligned, in my opinion, even though it is a, a surprisingly solid institution. So that's the easy one out of the way. For me, the, the knowledge isn't important, right? The knowledge of, I, I, I still have to sort of sit there and sort of work out how do I do the sort of current law with my hands and, and like my master's was electronics and electrical engineering. You know, the, the knowledge, the, the rote memory is functionally useless to me especially like now, what am I, 10 years plus down the line, where, you know, my undergrad is useless, fun. I don't think there's any knowledge left from that time in my head. I'll put it that way. However, the the meta knowledge, right, the, the, the knowing how to research and knowing how to ask questions and knowing how to present ideas, knowing how to evaluate options, that is what I do day in, day out. And I learned those skills from both my undergrad, from the PhD. And the that I have never seen a 
a MOOC model, the so a massive or massively online online course. What's the other O in MOOC? A massive. I don't know. Hang on, so someone can, someone can Google that while I'm ranting. So I've never seen a version of MOOCs, whether it's Coursera, whether it's Khan Academy, whatever. It I've never seen one that works, to, that satisfies that interpersonal meta knowledge. And now, I personally think that the way that we should be doing it, both as an industry and in terms of academia, is that especially we should actually take advantage of COVID and say, right, we've got the entire workforce working or technology workforce working from home and they're probably going to stay there for at least six months to a year, probably at least. So why don't we just like do 30 minute matchups between students and random technologists in their field? Just yeah. go, look, talk to this fucker for a while. It's not graded. It's not supposed to be a didactic exchange. It's not supposed to be, I'm going to give you a presentation because if, if the student wants to go and learn about topic X, as you say, the resources are out there. The problem is that those resources don't always have a capability of being able to answer questions and follow up and go, how does that apply into situation X? Or can you explain this to me? This is my background. Can you chop this into something that's digestible for me and um, I think that arguably is where the university should be thriving and I don't know if they're doing anything on that behind the scenes because I'm not a student and no one's asked me to talk to any kids that's maybe for the best yeah but it's it's strange because I uh, had already sort of come up through where the universities were adopting the more yay capitalism approach, especially with the glut of international students coming in, the reduction of class sizes, the reduction of lecture sizes, and basically a drive away from high-end research to the sausage mill and basically the grind of get the students in, get the money, get them out, give them a piece of paper. That's, I, I, don't, I don't think COVID's done that much to universities. I think that the, the shift that the universities made from being centers of excellence to being paper mills is where things are really screwed. Yeah, no, in fairness, I, I, I agree. I think if anything, all COVID has done is pushed a position where the question needs to be asked more clearly because the face-to-face -face versus online has been removed. So therefore it makes that direct comparison more relevant. MOOC stands for Massive Open Online Course, which we obviously all knew. Jason, no, I'm really interested, right? So, I mean, Bolster and I are vaguely recovering academics, having spent far, far, far too much of our life in university. Yeah. You represent someone who's more self-taught, right? Yeah. <laughs> You're not, you're not an academic, well, well, but, you know, well, you've written the textbook, but you're not an academic. You know, what, what are your thoughts on this? I suppose it, it's worth going back to, to where I started, which was, I left school in 1988. I was 16. And two weeks later, I started at a computing college. But instead of it being five days a week, doing the academic BTEC MVQ level three, which we're one of the first to do. We did it one day a week and four days a week were on work placement. So I ended up doing electronics as well. My, my first YTS job, I was being paid 35 quid a week as well for doing this thing for two years. Was Thank you, idiot. That was good money, dude. Yeah. <laughs> It, it, it bought a lot of records and bass <laughs> guitars and pedals and things like that. Yeah, and so that one day we, we were doing all the usual stuff and it branched into two directions. You're either doing sort of some form of electronics engineering, which is what I was going to do, or programming. Now, all the programming guys were either doing COBOL or C because in the same way as the universities were feeding into business in the locality. So if there's a demand for COBOL, then you teach COBOL. Doof, off you go, you know? And if you teach C, if someone's using C for electronics, then boom, you go and learn C. That's how it was. It was as 
black and white is that so over the course of I, I took a bit of a break from it all from 91 to 95 that's when I worked in a record shop I actually learned more about supply chain in the record shop than anything I actually and I did a blog post about this years ago the the manager there taught me the art of prediction but not on a computer you know it was all about watching the customer watching the buying patterns analyzing them and then making educated guesses you know and being allowed to be wrong at the same time you know so my my career has always been sort of this waving path of trying to figure out what's coming next so fast forward i moved over in 2004 for a few years there was nothing going on i didn't know anybody it's actually twitter that saved me because that's how i met matt johnson that's how i ended up in the room with i and i and most of the startups around that table are still good friends now you know but that network element was missing for a good five years for me you know so i couldn't get work i couldn't find anything i found out very quickly that not having a degree at that time basically meant you were unemployable yeah which was really hard for me because i ain't got a degree and i ain't gonna get one as much as i occasionally whine on about it that i don't have one i've stopped that now because someone said yeah, but, but the thing is, but honestly, you wrote, you, wrote, you wrote a book. Yeah, but then, no, but the thing is, though, Jess, I mean, for me, you are literally the personification of the reason why a degree doesn't matter, right? You know what you're doing. You're incredibly successful. You've, you honestly know this field better than most people I know and better than the vast majority of people with degree and many years of experience under their belt, <clears throat> you've written the textbook on machine learning. At this point, you should hold up your book just every every week, have it sitting there so you can hold it up when it's queued. Anyway, but do you know what I mean? Like, <clears throat> for me, you the person. And, and, that, and, and that's really right. get it for you. But for, that, for me, you you are the, hang on, Holster, speak. So there we go. Just, just, just for the product placement. But, uh... but the but you know what I mean? For me, you're the personification you're, you're, you're of exactly that. No, but you 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 are the personification to me of exactly why you don't need to follow that traditional course of the traditional. Right, so so I, I'm going to argue here because you don't need to, but it doesn't not help. So, for instance, that statement makes a lot more sense if you've spent a bit of time academically studying linear uh, boolean uh, boolean algebra. So that many negations kind of helps. But I mean, I would agree that Jace is a poster child for yes from a practical standpoint, from a literally an engineering standpoint, you can do an awful lot without any formal education. And you can, as a, as a well, or as a self-driven individual driven by mm. curiosity, interest, and fixing problems as they come Absolutely. along. And that is the guts of my career over the last 30 yeah. years. Yeah, the danger in terms of, uh, without blowing smoke up his ass anymore, I mean, the danger of, of using someone like Jace as a poster child for, oh, we can all be AI engineers. The problem is that the rarity isn't the AI engineering. The rarity is the self-driven curiosity and experimental attitude. And yeah. ironically enough, that can be maybe not taught, but it can be curated and it can be cultivated by having communities like academic institutions. So while people like Jace and argue, I, I'd like to think that I had this anyway and that the university just provided an opportunity for me to take advantage of all of their toys rather than pay like 30 grand for a CNC myself. Like, I do think that there, there should be a place for local physical institutions to provide, I hate to use this particular phrase, but for safe spaces for fucking around and growing and cultivating a, not just individuals, but communities of individuals. Now, I'm also even more biased than usual because even though those institutions exist, I disagreed with their implementation of that community of practice and then fucked off and made Farset Labs as a more customized and flexible community of practice that wasn't intended to be a protest against the institution of academic universities themselves it was more a critique that i wish something 
or I wish the operations of something like Farset Labs were easier to pull off within those kind of institutions. And for, for the record, having a 3D printer and a laser cutter in the corner of a room does not make a, a lab into a hackerspace. What makes a, a lab into a hackerspace is having a community of people who can play an experiment and having coverage from some kind of management authority above them to give them a safe protection that says, if you fuck up, I have your back. Um, yeah. And that's usually what's missing. And that, no, I, look, I, I totally agree. And I think this is the thing that, you know, academia's, academia's role has to become less didactic and pedagogical and more around exactly what you're saying. It's around building communities, building networks, building relationships, pe building uh, environments where, as you say, people can experiment and fuck up and it's okay. And they can learn from their peers as much as they learn from their academic seniors you know from from the lectures and i think that's actually that, that honestly one of the most key things about it it's building that environment where you're learning from each other as much as you're learning from your teachers mm. i think that's the bit that the universities are going to have to shift to to understand that 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 their role is more around building community than it is around building uh, and around just simply delivering content because mm. the content we delivered we can do that yeah Coursera does it really really well so there's another interesting one. This is a little bit of a, it, it drifts towards the personal, but hopefully it'll make sense in the grand scheme of things. I said before about it, it is, it has been depressing to come up through my career during a phase where universities are getting further and further away from individualized relationship building education and drifting towards I have a lecture hall with 250 people in it and I'm going to give you a 90 minute lecture and you can maybe visit my office between these 40 minute windows twice on Tuesdays. That has been sad because ironically enough, most of my academic career or the early part of my academic career, I got simultaneously got away and learned more from individual relationships with individual lecturers than through almost any of the lectures and like the actual ability to talk with a f expert in their field whether they're a professor or reader or whatever it doesn't really matter but talk about basically talk to talking to a grown-up because we've got to remember that we're talking about 18 year old kids coming in that have unfortunately been brought up on wackos like us doing remote school visits and saying, oh, the world is your oyster and everything's going to be fantastic. They just expect to be handed, oh, by the way, you're now a startup billionaire. Well done. But unfortunately, there are a few steps in between and that can be quite challenging for people. I, I, uh, that The idea that you can scale that and just say, right, We've, we've upped our class sizes from 20 to 40 and there's going to be no deficiency in education quality. That's bullshit. Realistically, if, if I was in charge of education, if I, was, if I was dictating education policy, I would throw a little bit of a strange one in. And notice that this is, if I say dictate, as in nobody can question it, that we shouldn't necessarily focus on getting everybody up to the same wonderful level all the time. We should be creating environments that curate and cultivate maybe a top two, three, four percent of people who are then able to be independent trailblazers on their own so that you have the institution that provides a baseband of sort of technical understanding, engineering understanding, whatever, but then provides these spaces that people can step up into and take additional responsibility, explore further, have a little bit of backing from either the universities or local councils or whatever. Don't try and fix it on this idea of, oh, we are exceptional and we are able to put everybody up to the top of everything because it just doesn't fucking work like that. And the only way that you manage to do that is by completely invalidating the worth of your uh, degrees by curving everything so much that the difference between a first and a fuck up is fuck all. I mean, I, I don't know whether anyone remembers this, but I was in the year whenever there was a student who sued the university because they didn't get the right grade. It was just, 
it, it was horrifying for the academics involved because yeah. they literally had to then turn around and reflexively butcher the the student because they had to demonstrate how he did not satisfy the requirements for the degree and then the flip side was well it's your job to get him to that stage of the degree and then you end up with this very very strange combative environment where you're going oh yeah but we did we gave him the opportunity oh no you're not supposed to give him the opportunity you're supposed to make him be better i'm going how the fuck does that work so yeah accommodate exceptional people don't try and expect everybody to be exceptional otherwise you invalidate the word exceptional so End you're, of basically, rant. <laughs> you're basically advocating technocratic elitism which i'm i'm, I'm all for it <laughs> yeah it's yeah it's fine I mean, I, I, technocracy yes elitism no i mean opportunity for all but no no opportunity <laughs> for all and then if they can get if they can do something with it great i mean i'd, I'd say not even technocratic but duocratic like even if you fuck up that's at least more interesting than sitting on your arse and doing nothing all day that's yep. true i agree totally agree so yeah party political broadcast from bolster yeah, when are we when are we going to just form a political party? Uh, it seems oh, like no. it seems no. like the next. It seems no. like the next is. No, no, no. A I N I twenty one, Austin. I'm up for it. <laughs> no, I mean realistically, the only way that that would actually make sense in any way is if we were somehow able to create an Arlene bot, and, and, <laughs> and just and. and I mean, you could do... Oh, has anyone done that yet? Has anyone taken the answer? Hold on, hold on, hold on. I literally I'm was about to say, I'm just going to spin up like Q&A maker and just upload all of the Hansard discussions labelled. I, I talked about it a couple of years ago. And, I don't know if anyone's actually done it because oh, like an Arlene chatbot would be lovely. I did a Markov question yeah. generator. That was then. I mean, that, oh, that's a while ago now. It's quite a few years ago. Oh, see. surely, surely we could do this. Surely we can create a Northern Ireland First Minister bot. <laughs> I'm going to, going to be more respectful than, than what you just said. Uh, well, yeah, 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 we can. But what we should do is 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 sign up to one of the accelerators and then outsource it to Croatia first. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was just cruel. It was, wasn't it? But you know, I need my entertainment. It's it's so close to Christmas. Oh, no, I mean, it's it's so sad. But yeah. well, you know what? So that totally, I'm gonna. It's a total pivot. But you know, one of the things that we were talking about at AI Con, I guess, a little bit last week, and you know, Maggie gave the presentation, the AI Center of Excellence thing, and. What you've just said, you know, I source the work to Croatia kind of highlights that one of the issues that we have here in Northern Ireland is availability of talent, availability of people. If we're in a position where... Oh, no, we sold ourselves as being too cheap and now we're expensive. Oh, no. Yeah, I know. Fucking hell. But you know what I mean? If we're in a situation where Northern Ireland startups are outsourcing their work to Croatia rather than hiring local developers, where have we gone wrong and how do we fix that? Oh no, no, this is the Silicon Valley model, don't you know? So this is this is this is we, we're replicating we're not in Silicon Valley. We don't want to be Silicon Valley. We're Northern Ireland. We're different and we're better, right? <laughs> 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 no, I, mean, I know, but I mean, this was this is the stated goal of Northern Ireland's innovation policy: is make Northern Ireland more like Silicon Valley. And I'm imagining that none of them have been south of market because they 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 just don't know what the fuck they're talking about. And I'm going right, okay. So are you going to establish a naval yard in the middle of Belfast, have a world war, throw a couple of nuclear physicists that you maybe stole from Berlin? into local institutions wait for 60 years for Fairchild to fundamentally change the concept of how like physics works and then have a revolt within that company to then spin out a competitive market that then both drove up the price of individual talent but also 
fundamentally changed how the local universities treated IP to then turn around and say, oh no, we're not going to take 20% of every idea you have. You are going to own all of the IP if you generate it within our university. Come join us, use our stuff, create our community. So yeah, it'd be nice if we actually tried to do that that way, but we didn't. We looked at how it ended up and said, oh, we need more incubators. Yeah, but how do we fix this? I mean, like the thing is, like fundamentally, we, we have a supply and demand issue here in Northern Ireland at the moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, all well, two of you work for commercial organizations. I work for the public sector. I would imagine all three of us are currently trying to hire people, right? Put your hand up if you're not hiring anyone at the moment or not willing to hire anyone at the moment. Well, I'm waiting, on, waiting on the rest um, to come through. <laughs> Yeah, but you know what I mean? It's like any one of us would hire somebody tomorrow if the right person came along. What do we do to try and sor solve this problem? Because if we're in a situation where Northern Ireland's USPs are all completely screwed up by the fact that if you come and set up your business here in Northern Ireland, whether you're from here or you're an FDI, if the solution is that you outsource your development to Croatia or Bulgaria, that doesn't help Northern Ireland. That helps Croatia and Bulgaria. Yeah, it does. And that's what happens. Uh, okay, so there's an argument here that says if it can be outsourced, then fucking outsource it. Right? That's fine. I mean, we. the irony is that especially whenever we're talking about AI and machine learning, fundamentally what we're doing is outsourcing human innovation to a machine. That's it. That's That's all we do. We are taking the bits that we have solved either through data or through training uh, or through innovation in algorithms and basically just repeat, we're talking about human scalability. So mm, I would say that, and how would you put this nicely? I have not been part of any team that has been, or have I have not worked with any outsourcing team that has been able to execute on any form of innovation that they weren't directly told to do and how to do it. So like, I mean, we're not going to do anything new. Congratulations, you'll be able to update the website. Congratulations, here's my DB architecture. Congratulations, uh, you're able to, you know, create my Java pipeline and all that, and you're able to outsource QA, great. Fundamentally, those aren't innovative activities at all. I'm kind of jaded because literally my job at the minute is to take away the boring stuff. Yeah. But hold on a second. Actually, okay, let me roll back. There's been a couple of good cases of outsourcing that's worked. So Operation Arm is a good example of that, where Charlene outsourced development to, I think it was Poland. And she did a talk about it three or four months ago on one of the race events. And it was about building that relationship between the development team so far away and actually getting what you want. Because the, the key missing element is how a founder communicates to a technical team that they've never met before. That's actually one of the new key skills. It's a soft skill. It's a hard soft skill to learn. And it's one of the reasons I get phone calls or someone says, you need to speak to Jace or you need, you know, the number of startups that get referred to me now about this issue is actually quite high. Now, the reason I see that, and it's something I wrote about a long while ago, 2014 was a good year for blog posts for me, was FDI rose immensely because we said we had this talent pool here, which we do, but the talent pool hasn't really grown. It's kind of stayed the same and they moved from FDI to FDI, I'm assuming, and getting another job after so long, you know, because I would say every FDI out in, in Belfast right now is looking. Oh yeah. I, oh, you no. know what? I, I don't even keep up with it anymore. I, I, I just don't, I don't even get involved. I try and keep out of it in all, in all honesty. I, I only end up being able to keep up with any of this because I'm 
generally either getting random questions with people going here bolster can you have a look at my cv not for not for them suggesting that i hire them or anything like that but just because they just want an extra pair of eyes and they know that i'm sort of looking at this stuff and you there is a bit of a two years and then you're not out but moving around culture which is perfect and it's perfect for fdis and it's perfect for local politicians because a local politician's lifetime isn't necessarily going to be long enough to care about you know oh they finally caught up with us that we've been selling the same six people to a dozen companies for a decade you know the the fear that i have is that the not that the whole thing's going to implode but that that it's just going to keep trundling along and no one's actually going to do anything interesting because for want of a better phrase i i I would be hard pressed to pick out any local innovative startups that have gone beyond North Island at all. They're all either, how do we apply cool technology X to local problem Y? And economically, that's great. That is fantastic. Small business is the backbone of the economy. So great. But matching that up with the narrative of we are some kind of innovative center of excellence for software engineering or AI or cybersecurity or whatever the the current you know mood is. It's just that no one's going to listen, and that we're going to have political leaders and economic think tanks and various self interested groups making these grand proclamations, and no one's going to listen to them, and the FDIs are going to dry up. Yeah. Two, two, two things kind of hit me today <laughs> one of them literally hit me about three seconds ago firstly accelerators in general not just over here god he's often going to the bog again austin sort your bladder out mate oh he's back sorry <laughs> no 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 that's... the dog's bladder is the problem this time not me oh, really? <laughs> sorry right <laughs> accelerators being accelerators what you always hear who goes in but you never hear the progress report when they go out <laughs> and you know it's swear to god next time we do this i'm printing off jace bingo cards <laughs> you know it's just how i am and we love you yeah of course you do um <laughs> Lying sod. Uh, Austin, here's a question for you. Belltech yeah. and AI Conf, because yeah. they were virtual this year, online, were you measuring the reach? Were people coming from different countries? I need to get, <clears throat> I haven't checked in with AI Con on that, but the number of registrations that we got were just ridiculous compared to what we had face to face. I think we had about 900 people registered where like face-to-face -face in Belfast, we could only have 250, 300 in the room. Yeah. Um, we definitely had more people from outside of Northern Ireland. So last year, AI con, uh, be honest, like the 80 plus percent, 90 plus percent would have been from here. It was all local folks. Yeah. We definitely had a further reach. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And I think, like from my perspective, one of the most interesting things about it was it wasn't just about the reach externally, it was about the reach of who we pulled in to speak. So I was very, very self-indulgent this year by completely throwing off all corporate shackles and doing a session about art and music. And I didn't have any Northern Ireland speakers. Now, I, you guys know I tend to, I'm always very supportive of Northern Ireland industry and what, what we have here, but... I did reach out and try and find out if I could find anybody within the art and culture world in Northern Ireland who would be good to have speaking. Didn't really get a lot of comeback. And I was lucky enough to be able to pull in some genuinely phenomenal speakers, global level type stuff. And it was cool because, you know, Pablo from Google was able to pre-record his talk and we were able to do it. Jenny Kleeman in London was able to join via voice. Marika over in Cheltenham along with her folks were able to join. And you know, it, it came together really well. So it's it's one of those interesting things of showing that 
it's a local event, but actually I was able to reach much further afield. I tried to get Lex Friedman, but it didn't work, which was disappointing. But on the whole, I think it came together really well. And I think across the two days, we had a really nice balance of global, national, international, and local. And yeah, it's, it's interesting to see. I mean, I, I'm, I'm quite, I'm very happy with how the whole thing came across. What did you, what did you guys think of it? I didn't see it much the second day. Yeah, the first day morning was really good. Don't run off Austin, I'm talking about. Sorry, dog problems. <sighs> you just peed yourself and it's come out of your ankles. That's why you went to the door. That's why you went to the door. I, I'm in my downstairs, the, the room downstairs, which is uh, basically sort of my office and sort of just the junk room where we store everything. But this is also the only route that the dog has to the back garden to pee. So she just stands out there and barks to get in here. And then I let her out and then she stands in here and barks to get back out again. So that's why I migrate from here to the kitchen, to the living room, to the bedroom, depending on what time of the day it is. I'll, I'll be honest with you. With most conferences, I tend to, to watch them. You know, I, it's it, it's like it's like being a gigging musician. You tend not to go and see bands and stuff because you're just that you're that busy playing yourself. You know, if you're doing gigs, you're not really watching anybody else. You sort of you're on stage, you get off stage, you go and get a curry, and you you go again. And if I'm not talking and and not not listening to my own voice, because obviously that's what fuels all of this, then I, I don't actually listen to a lot of stuff. I was interested in the fintech part, but panel discussions can get very dry very quickly in that sector. And yep. I've got I've got work going on here and stuff in my ears from from AI comps. I wasn't actually looking at anything; I was just listening. And yeah, it was okay. I, I can't I, I can't complain. It's like I didn't pay for it, so I'm not really arguing. Well, you, hey, you got what you paid for. Exactly. And boss has gone really quiet as well, hasn't he? <laughs> You see? Oh. Um. I don't know, no, nothing strange to add. I mean, I, I, I'm in a similar boat as James Burt, but I haven't, frankly, the past, because I was doing or participating in some of the, of the development of the, one of the animations that made it through, which was an awful lot of fun to do, but it was a very, very hectic six weeks whenever you're talking about a combination between that and the six other things that I have to do in life. So whenever it actually came down to the day i'll be honest i watched some of the keynote after no not the keynote because we couldn't get in on the first day but yeah watch a bit of the of glenn's animations then can't remember who it was going through some of them and then once it got to the point where our animation went up i just went right okay they published it we can now share it online and then i can go back to bed and yeah it, it's it, from my perspective i I, this kind of goes back to the earlier point where it, conferences without the person-to-person -person interaction, I just don't get it. I, I'm, I'm running out of it. I'm running out of the energy to, I mean, NIDC, again, almost sort of from Jason's point of view, I had more fun dealing with the other speakers and with the other organizers as part of the online aspect of NIDC. I didn't get nearly as much audience interaction and trying to manage audience interaction. It's just this entire like past year has, as a speaker has felt so strange and so alienating because I'm very used to flying by the seat of my pants and going by the audience reaction to work out, have I gone a bit too far? Do I need to dial it down? Or if this is a good audience, can I take this to the next level? Or am I boring the shit out of them by going off on a wild tangent? Or do they just want the bang, 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 this is the official word? Honestly, the, the COVID, not just AICon, not just NITC, the, the COVID speaker circuit is not as much fun it's just not. No, it's not. And, and I made a conscious effort this year to, with, with the Kafka stuff, I'm doing an awful lot more with Confluent at the moment than I ever have done because the opportunity is there to do so. So I've been doing talks, not in UK time. I've been doing them Eastern, you know, Eastern time instead. I've been talking at 11 o'clock at night, which is great because I can, I can have a beer in my hand when I'm doing the talk, which is fine. But it's the same thing, I, especially on Zoom. When I've got the slides in front of me, I can't see anybody. So I don't know who gets the joke or who doesn't. 
you know, and I've had to really sort of dial it down. And then I was told to dial it back up again. It's like, okay. It is weird though, isn't it? I mean, it's, I, I totally agree with you. So I, on the one hand with AI con, I mean, I'm really happy with what we pulled together, right? I think the content was great. I think we got really good speakers that we probably wouldn't have got locally. You know, if we had to have all of those people in the room, it would not have happened. But honestly, it, it's a tough one. So funny enough, I got a, a phone call from somebody from COGX the other day. Like COGX is an excellent conference. Have either of you guys been? No, I haven't. I, I mean, I've heard good things about it, but I have not been. I was, I was there a couple of years ago and it was honestly brilliant. Like genuinely, you know, got to see Stuart Russell speak. You know, absolutely amazing show, great setup phenomenal on multiple stages it was like literally going to a festival that just happened to be around ai and tech talks and last year i was registered for it as an online event and literally didn't listen to a single talk did not tune in at all because i'm busy i have work to do i can't take three days out to go and watch online talks and nor not even if i, I didn't have the time i just honestly don't really have the motivation and I think, you know, with AI con, I'm hopeful that, you know, when we put all this stuff downstream online and it's all going to be on YouTube, it's cool because we can share the stuff. So we did some really cool shit and hopefully people can watch it whenever they feel like it. But you honestly just can't replace that. It's not even about, it is about the face-to-face, -face, but it's also about that reason to get out of work for a day or for two days to go and listen to something where you do not, you can stop being on your laptop. And I honestly, like, by the way, Bolster, I told you before, like the, the, the animation you guys did was brilliant. They were all brilliant. I was involved with Tom and doing some of the judging and it was one of those bizarre ones where almost every, every bit of the judging was like, caveat at the start, these people are my friends. All my opinions were totally biased. <laughs> But this is fucking brilliant. But yeah, I mean, they, they came together brilliantly. You know, that opportunity to do that thing with Future Screens and I, it was brilliant. All of the animations were amazing, hugely enjoyable. But yeah, it, it, it just, you can't replace that thing of just going, instead of waking up nine o'clock in the morning or waking up in the morning and, you know, walking the dog, having a cup of coffee and then sitting down at your laptop to start work, you actually have to go somewhere to be at a venue to listen to talks. And therefore, you can't do any work that day. It's blocked out of your calendar. Very, very hard to do that at a virtual event. Very it hard. It is completely. I mean, that's why I used to do Strata. It's, I'm out the door at three o'clock in the morning to get to the airport, to have a nice breakfast, to jump on a plane, to get to London City Airport, to get to Exile Centre, to say hello to my friends. And when I walk in, I'm walking straight to the main hall and then getting my brains blown out because James Burke's speaking. <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> and it was, it was amazing. You know, key, keynote speak, you know, a lot of you, you get the corporate IBM do their thing, Cloudera do their thing, yeah, 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 fine. But some of them, I've forgotten the lady's name, she wrote a book called Dear Data, and her and a friend were doing data visualizations on postcards. They draw them out. Oh, yeah, that's uh, that was a brilliant book. It was, yeah, I bought it for my daughter, but she loves it. And yeah, it's the one time I've I was in the trade hall. And she walked past me. I actually turned around and said, excuse me, excuse me. She went, yeah, yeah, what, what's up? I said, I just want to say, love the talk this morning. It's fantastic. Best thing I've seen in years. Oh, great. Really? You think so? Yeah, yeah. It's little things like that. Mm. It's little things yeah. like that that make all the difference. And yes, it's definitely, yeah. Absolutely fantastic talk. And I mean, there was 2,000 people in the auditorium and we're all going, this is brilliant. The next talk is from the guy from Uber saying, we do 10 million measurements a second. Great. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> it's not on the postcard. Yeah. I, I, and I, get, I just get blown away by that kind of stuff. And so the last, the last strata I did, I, I spent more time talking to the guys at Zara than I did any of the vendors because I'm obsessed with Zara's business model. So it's just like, tell me more. So all these Spanish guys sat down with me telling me all this stuff. It's great. I, yeah. They don't happen every day. Those things don't happen every day and they don't happen online. So, I mean, but this year has been really interesting because I sort of started off the year not doing any talks. The first one I actually did was the Belltech panel. That was the first talk I did all year because I'd sort of taken last year off as well because I was just getting settled into Digitalis. And yeah, so that, that panel was the first one we did. Well, I did, sorry. 
and then confidence start knocking and go, can you do stuff from Cleveland? Like, yeah, I'll do Cleveland. Just so I can say, hello, Cleveland, at the start. Oh, and see I was going to say, that, that's the um, only reason to do it. It was the only reason I did it. And my, my first slide did say, hello, Cleveland. And I was so happy. <laughs> About two people got it. But anyway, it doesn't matter. But they said, oh, well, and the next thing I get this, this DM through that says, do you, want, do you want to do the Confluent podcast interview? And it's like, me? Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. Well, what do you want to talk about? Talk about whatever you want. Okay. So we literally did this interview for half for an hour, whole hour, just talking about Kafka development, Kafka in the you know, front line working with Kafka. And even Confluent came away and got, oh god, we not thought of that. Yeah, it's like don't don't assume that everyone knows your architecture. They don't. You know. No, I had a great time. So this year's been really cool actually. And it, my, my working day still hasn't changed. This has been me for nine years. I work from home. And that's so, not a so you, you, you whining, Austin, that you have to drive 60 miles to do a presentation. Everyone got used to get pissed off from me for not driving 70 miles to do a meetup for half an hour <laughs> and drive 70 miles back home again. And it's like, yeah, no. I'm, I'm kind of interested in that, year. So the thing is, I think be between the three of us, you're, you're the only one that has been living in isolation in the middle of nowhere under a tree in a log cabin somewhere in a forest for... Yeah. Like, kids. Like, it's 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 North Antrim. It's not exactly like it's it's, it's, not, it's, North Antrim. it's not North Antrim. It's not even. It's not it's, even. It's, it's, it's County London Day. Yeah, he's uh, everywhere. Uh, he's a, he's a wildling. He's the other side of the wall, right? But but like just for you, I, I am I am west of the band. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But like <laughs> realistically, for for me, I've gone from commuting every single day to the office or to the airport more often than not to working from home and I love it right but you've been doing this for over a decade like also I assume you're kind of the same right you're working from home more than you've ever done before Jess how do you find looking at this when you see the rest of us starting to adjust to being in your world oh it's fucking hilarious all you whingers going on and uh, I, need to get, I need to see people again no anyway joking aside no I don't mean that at all it is actually been little bit. The most, little bit. The most, uh, oh, here I'm not whinging. I fucking love it, man. This is honestly working from home is just it's no. fantastic. I'm never going back to an office. But this year, out of all the years that I work from home, has been the toughest because there's that underlying current of COVID. Mm. Okay, and I, I thought, I thought, yeah, this is fine. Everyone's gonna work from home and talk about it and all the rest of it and i'll just carry on like nothing ever happened it's just gonna be a normal day for me wrong no the cognitive load of covid really messed with my head this year to the point of mental exhaustion that i did not see coming and i took a huge dip huge dip in sort of july august time and you know and there's you know i mean daughter was going to uni and that kind of thing so there's a lot of prep going on and and then there's a whole thing about the exams that we spoke about a couple of months ago. All that stuff. Yeah, so July, August, I was exhausted. And I still am exhausted. You know, work has been busy, which is great. Now, on the flip side of that, I'm talking to my friends and some of them have been furloughed, some have lost a job, some didn't know what was going on, some have been messed about for six months, all that kind of thing. And you think, I'm really blessed here. I cannot complain one bit. Yeah, totally. I can't complain. I have got nothing to whinge about at this point on, about what's going on, you know? In fairness, I've, I've talked to a couple of colleagues who, who were finding the whole situation difficult. Yeah. And I was honestly quite blunt. I was like, look, we are in the most privileged position we could possibly be in, right? Yeah. We have a job. We have no worry of losing that job. We are able to work as much, if not more product productively than we ever did. We are literally the 0.00001% of the entire freaking planet at the moment. Yeah. You know? And some of those people who were really struggling and finding it difficult have subsequently got coronavirus. And I've seen them go through not just the mental struggle of dealing with what we've 
dealt with over the last eight, nine months, but I've also seen them go through the physical consequences of developing the virus. Mm -hmm. And it's been hard, you know, I mean, some of them have really struggled, you know, people who, someone, someone who I worked with, who I remember at one point telling them they had to take the day off because they were sick and I didn't want them in the office spreading, you know, but spreading whatever they had mm -hmm. to that same person taking two weeks off work. You know, and when you've got someone who you have to send them home when they're sick is voluntarily taking two weeks off, you know that shit's serious, you know? Yeah. And I mean, it's it's got to that point, especially with the second wave, that's that's much more significant. I think across the board, everyone's probably seen more direct interactions. My son is currently locked in his bedroom because he tested positive for coronavirus and I'm self-isolating, right? I've tested negative, I'm fine. And he's fine too, right? He had symptoms for a couple of days, Got him tested, tested positive, he's fine. He was, I think he has probably turned out to be the only person in Northern Ireland who was genuinely overjoyed to test positive for coronavirus. <laughs> when I told him he tested positive, I have never seen this just smile just broke out in his face. <laughs> I think it was a combination of knowing that he was going to get another like eight or nine days off school and eight months of low key vague anxiety finally just gone because he's like, Fuck is that? I've it? got it now. Yeah, and like he's only thirteen. Right? So like, yeah, kids, but, uh, kids that a... age are young and healthy. That it's it's not a big deal, right? If you're, it's one of those bizarre viruses that if you're young and healthy, it does nothing to you. If you're not, it can kill you. It, it does nothing to you. It it just infects anyone that you walk past. I mean, I have to say the the it is going to be an awful lot of fun watching the next five years of the data science world basically cream itself over COVID because it's the ultimate. I mean, if I was a student coming through and even whispering along the world of data science, I just COVID would be too much fun to play with, which is a tragic thing to say, but it is a couple of really weird collisions, which is, as you say, the differential symptomatic approach so you know depending on who you are it's not going to affect you in the same way but it might change the infection rate anyway like that's a modeler's dream and i have to say that one of the things that's really disappointed me over the past nine months is that the at the beginning how would you put it so going back to austin's earlier point we are the luckiest of the lucky and I've actually taken it in a bit of a weird approach or a psychological approach of going, right, there is loads of the economy that is fundamentally fucked. So it is part of our responsibility to keep going because we can. As part of that, we should still, even though we don't need to go out, we should still be well behaved, so to speak. And it's <laughs> basically because... If I get sick to the point that my employer is wondering whether it's worth keeping me around anymore, that's not good. But yeah, I was hoping at the beginning of all of this that there would be an improvement in discourse around how we talk about the numbers on this. And it's just not happened. People are as feckless and ignorant and reductivist as they were whenever we started. Um, I'm, still, I'm still refusing to walk through town. Yeah. Yeah, I, I won't. I, I, the, the, the most I will do is go to Tesco Express to get milk. Yeah. And even then, if there's too many in the shop, you know, get I'm not going in. Yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll come back later. I, I, I'm exactly the same. And it's, it's, it's been a really interesting, like the last couple of weeks have been fascinating for me because I've seen so many people, on the one hand, I mean, you see a very small number of people who take the whole thing very seriously and completely self-isolate. And then you see an awful lot of people just kind of going out to the pub and treating life as normal. And I've been very much on the introvert, reclusive, lock of myself in a room kind of thing for the last eight months. But despite my very rarely going out, I have not gone out socially at all since February. In the last, we kind of put ourselves into lockdown about a week before lockdown happens at some point in mid-March. Yeah. Same. Since mid-March, I have gone to a friend's house for dinner twice. And that's been the extent of my social interactions with other human beings for the last mm. like eight months. 
despite that, my son still got coronavirus and we live in the house with him, sit at the table having dinner with him, give him hugs in the morning, during the day, give him hugs at night. Somehow I managed to avoid getting it. And again, if we want to talk about privileged and luckiest people on earth, I honestly, that just put me up to the not point not 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 one percent right mm -hmm. you know i mean i was literally directly directly in contact with a case who lives in my house and is still upstairs right now and he's bored now he's actually bored <laughs> but yeah i mean it's, it's again it's one of these things it does i hope that this is something that makes people be a little bit more thankful for what they have but th that's that's not quite what's been frustrating me in, in a strange way right so I, I apologize for using the word luck it wasn't what i meant to imply but it is it is right we are the luckiest of the lucky however my big concern has been that we statistics are hard to understand and they're even harder to internalize and rationalize and my fear you were talking about your son turning around and going and getting the big smile on his face of going oh i've got it out of the way fantastic i'm going no 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 that's not how any of this works that that's not how any of this as a as a community discussion works it's you just nothing changes you your your behavior should stay whatever the current guidelines are i have no idea i'm the same as you guys i've more or less locked down although i do you know we we moved house but ironically enough going back to the earlier conversation my previous working environment was 1.2 meters across where i had the entirety of actually most of what i've still got around me but literally around me i mean we whatever we were doing if you remember the early days of vr you had this idea of the cave where the computer was all around you that's what i was living in it was a standing desk as well which was brilliant because standing desks are fantastic for an hour and a half two hours three hours of work it plus eight plus hours a day every day no fuck no but anyway going back to it, that i i haven't seen an improvement in the discourse around the statistical realities of this i i, I understand that it's my naivety of expecting it but you know i it would have been nice because this is the ultimate example of individual actions contributing to a greater outcome but people are so exceptionalist where they're going, oh, I didn't get it, therefore I'm fine. And I'm going, no, you didn't get it because a dozen other people didn't take risky behaviours. Not so that you can take risky behaviours, not. Mm. But, yeah. I think, no, I think that, that's, that's, what what I mean. that's what I'm saying. There's that concept of, I mean, you, know, you, you said you didn't want to say lucky, but you know, there's the philosophical concept of moral luck that I think we've all been somewhat subjective to, but literally in terms of that more fundamental sort of superstitious version of lucky, I am unbelievably lucky that I had a coronavirus case in my house and did not contract coronavirus. Like that is just pure, absolute fluke, traditional version of luck. Again, for me, it's like, holy shit, you know, this reinforces, despite the fact that I've had good hand hygiene and fairly self-isolated and all that kind of stuff, I'm not changing anything, like, at all. No. It, it, if anything, it's made me more concerned about the upcoming Christmas stuff that will I be happening. I am happen. so worried about Christmas now. I, and, and to be fair, not celebrating it this year. Uh, it's just like, a year off's fine. I, I'm not yep. panicking about it. it yeah, I'm with you. We, we, you know, we, we spoke to some folk and said, look, this is, this is what we're doing. And, and everyone went, yeah, fine. No problem, you know. So I, I'm kind of looking forward just to the time off because I've got time off anyway, but I'm not doing anything. You know, I, I actually just had, I just had two weeks off and two weeks off during which time I was still not going out. This was before the coronavirus case, to be clear. So literally the extent of my two weeks off was getting up in the morning, taking the dog for a walk at some point during the day, going with my wife for a swim in either a waterfall or the sea. And that was it for two weeks. It was awesome. Mm -hmm. It makes you realize that the small things in life are really, truly worth appreciating. Yeah, 
absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, uh, it's been interesting watching my behaviours change over the last, well, this, this year, basically. I mean, obviously all the music gear is set up. I haven't touched it. Uh, I really haven't touched it because I'm, I'm not performing. I'm, I've lost interest. It's like I need an audience if I'm going to play. And I've done some online stuff and it's nice to do, but it's just not the same, you know. And the only gig I've watched, because I had a load of entrepreneurs contacted me. Oh, Jace, we're going to do this online platform for concerts and stuff. Like, yeah, okay, off you go. Yeah, it's called MTV. Uh, yeah. You know, and that's all very well. But I mean, my, my wife got me tickets for Suzanne Vega in October. And it's great. It was actually watch it live. Suzanne was performing the Blue Note in New York City. I was watching it at home. And I was so nervous for the gig because it's just like, this doesn't feel right. It shouldn't feel right. I'm not in the room. And it's all back to that being in the room again. It's like, well, you know, am I going to miss the atmosphere? Am I going to miss that sort of edge of it's all about to start kind of thing? But it actually was amazing. It was really good. So it was fantastic. But Christmas, yeah, I mean, obviously there's lockdown in Northern Ireland. Viewer, we're in Northern Ireland. Um, <laughs> As if you didn't know the situation. Yeah. I, situation. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I still have to get back to my saying... Northern Ireland slang in my most poshest English accent. It's great fun. Where but the question I? is, what is the crack? What is the crack? <laughs> no, my favourite one is that's you. That's you. <laughs> I know. That's us. That's us now. Uh, <laughs> did, did I have a starter talk by saying about ye right at the start? I think I did. <laughs> I, think, I, I think I did a bell take one. <laughs> I could have been a bell take. I started like that. About ye. Anyway. So lockdown finishes on Friday. Well, 23.59 on Thursday. I'm actually bricking it for the next two weeks after that. It's not going to be good. It's, it's really not. not. It's, it's not. It's so, again, obviously, I, I, I've looked at the numbers because I'm a, not a nerd geek just like you guys. But realistically, we're looking at a situation. And if we look at how this has happened in other countries and what's happened, we're in a situation where we're we have had people in a lockdown situation retail has been closed in the point at which it is the busiest of the entire year we're going to see a restriction restrictions being removed on the 11th where we're going to see panic retail shopping we're also going to open up hospitality at the time when hospitality a lot of businesses the between the you know 11th and the 30th of december is when they make more money than they make any other point in the year so it is an absolute perfect storm of absolute chaos yeah. for physical contact. And well, then I mean, we can... I, have to say, I was happy to see... Together. Sorry, Rob, but uh, uh, of, of all of the people, laveries are shutting for the rest of the year. Are they? Right, they announced on their Facebook earlier tonight that they're just going, nah, nah. And I hope that that's the approach that people take because the, the ironic tragedy of all of this is that... We can do safe family Christmas if we don't do the fucking six weeks of office Christmas parties and, oh, we'll just get together just for a week before the holidays or whatever. If we, if we don't do any of that shit, then, yeah, family Christmas is actually legit because it's managed risk. I think one of the biggest challenges, going back to my sort of, anvil that I'm banging on people still really don't understand network effects it's just it's just boggling my mind where I'm going I don't want to have to pull out a whiteboard and go this is what an exponential looks like and this is why it looks like it I mean it's you meet think, three people and, three people this, meet three people. and this was the opportunity that that news outlets missed yes uh, I think they, they really could have gone that, amazingly to town on this and really push the message home of all it takes is one person in the room to fuck it all up yeah yeah and that's i think that's one of the things that actually again i was talking to a, a friend earlier today and hopefully we're going to try and write something up on this to, to try and give people a little bit more insight in terms of serial and serial intervals and incubation times right mm. so you know 
the thing is, there may not even be any overlap between case one, case two, and case three, you know, and like mm -hmm. case one can be spreading the various the virus to case two while they're asymptomatic. Case two can get the virus while case one is still asymptomatic and can have spread it to case three while case one is still asymptomatic. And this, you know, you can be literally talking about a 12 day period. And if you've got an R of two, you could be spreading this to, you know, basically two people every time you meet, you know, basically you can spread it to, to two people and they can spread it to two people. And it's exponential growth, but it's an exponential growth at a time when everyone is still asymptomatic. No, so we think that where we end lockdown on the 11th, that is two weeks before Christmas. And the, the double times are barely a week barely in a week, right? So we don't even have a point where all of the exposures that happen in the run up to Christmas, so that means when all the families get together on the 24th, 25th, you are all asymptomatic, but carrying the virus that you picked mm. up eight, four, five, six, seven days ago. And that's when it could all go horribly wrong. I'm the <laughs> voice of doom. Oh, no, no, no. The voice of doom gets worse because... The um, May I introduce Andrew Bolster. <laughs> the contact modeling gets worse because I think the thing that has been communicated the worst is okay, so we can all be nice and high minded about the network effect and all these lovely exponential factors and everything like that. But to take something really, really simple, which is the most risky thing to do is to sit in a room with an infected for person for 30 minutes. Yes. Right. It's you, you walk past an infected person in the street, not going to make a difference. Or there is an ex or a staggeringly low probability that your, your breathing is going to mix with their breathing and whatever. But popping over for a quick tea is going to be more risky than going to the shops. And there's a real strangeness in there where that's not... That's not been part of any of the government narrative. That's not been part of any of the advice. There hasn't been any discussion about time when from, from S, SIRB, whatever the modeling is, I can never remember. From that modeling perspective, the, the time of exposure is literally a multiplicative factor of your probability. And it's basically, right, 10 minutes and, and multiplying probabilities is another one that nobody seems to know how it actually works. And you're just kind of going, right, it's not like you have 100 chances. It's maybe that you have like 60 chances-ish. As Joe says, we missed a massive opportunity from an education perspective there. Mm -hmm. But it's, the thing is, the thing that I think is probably the most scary about it as well right the, the virus so the virus is aerosol based right it's not just droplets that's yeah. being proven now right so we have droplets we have aerosol and we have fomites right so it's surface based stuff so absolutely if you spend 30 minutes in a room with a person who's infected you're massively massively more at risk but on the flip side if families decide to be sensible and say okay well well, we'll, we'll have, I'll have my mom and dad over from two to four, and then we'll have, you know, a wife's mom and dad over from five to seven. Actually, if anyone in group one was infected, the aerosol particles could still be there, the droplets could still be there, the fomites could be still there and the thing. So actually, even that household mixing when separated, still massively increased risk. Mm -hmm. It's, so I, I've had this discussion with my partner, we'll put it that way, where it only takes one person to break the network or connect the network, there's a better analogy, that then all of somebody else's previous exposures in the two weeks, we'll say, are now part of your network. If you think about it as a, a time-based graph network. You know, so for instance, in terms of our social life, such as it is, we've stuck to literally, uh, there's a certain irony where we did end up picking a house around the corner from several, a couple of friends of ours. So our popping over to the friends, we still haven't been into their place in a while and they popped over to see the new house and that was about it. But they're literally a minute away and 
we have quantified that that's an acceptable risk because they're people that we deal with anyway. So the difference between dealing with the same person again within that two weeks is a different problem than adding a new person into the network. So then whenever my partner comes back and says, oh no, I just popped in and spoke to such and such and I'm going, for fuck's sake. Yeah. Yeah. Like that kind of thing is, uh, socialization is fine. I mean, I would argue that the discussions about bubble sizes would have been easier if there was a heavier emphasis on the changing of the bubbles. So whenever you were talking about the, oh, we'll have your in-laws in from four to five and my in-laws in from six to seven, right? The the time isn't even the risk. It's the, if you think about the sort of the, the bread slice of time, it's if you're adding somebody new into the mix, then you're connecting all of their previous two weeks into all of your future two weeks. Yeah, so we could have communicated this better. This could have been managed. I don't want to say managed, but... Yeah, managed is fine. Yeah. Man, uh, man has been communicated, and I think this is one of the things. I mean, I think all three of us are probably as aware of this or possibly more aware of this than most. Communicating complex data is difficult. Yeah. Communicating complex data to people who may not be that data literate is even more difficult. And I've been very disappointed in the fact that our media outlets and our and, and, and the global public health authorities, they really haven't done a good job in communicating this stuff. No, I think the best one I saw, I can't remember if it was Washington Post, but it was of one of the Korean patients, and it was actually a a visualization of the tracing of this one patient i think it was a lady i can't remember but she flew in from somewhere and the next day she went to church and infected 1200 people like that yeah. you know no if i remember correctly it was two churches over the course of three days so it was two different right, churches okay. so, yeah. so it was quite a few months ago this thing but it was incredibly interesting to read it was amazing and that was the best sort of representation i saw of it but like like you, Austin, I mean, we, we made a conscious decision here to just not go out a good fortnight before any lockdown was happening. And we'd already ordered a chest freezer, so we knew it was coming, and we were going to fill it as soon as we could. And that's what we did. So th it was... Reduced you, you've just reminded me of something, that, that, that BRB buying a chest freezer. There you go. See, behavioural insights and all that kind of thing. <laughs> How I make money out of that behavioural insight, that's really one I want to get to the bottom of because now you owe me 20 quid, Andrew. So, yeah, so I, I think after seeing that and then watching how the media, everyone boiled around the R number. I saw it as a viral coefficient. Yeah. That's essentially what it is. Yeah. And it's like, oh, the R number. If you distill things down into something too simple, then it's ignored just as quick. Yeah. as well and I remember driving out in July when it was the case of oh you can you can go out now and the pubs are open again and and I I, I we drove through Port Rush I've never seen anything like it I've never seen Port Rush so busy but at the same time I've never seen so many people not wearing a mask not certainly not two meters together they're more like two inches together yeah because they were desperate to get into the pub but then oh. I, I think it was, I think, you know, fundamentally, you know, we can't fault people as well, because that's one no. of the things that's been really clear is whilst I've absolutely loved working from home, I've had a few face-to-face -face meetings for work. And I think the, the first time that happened, and it had been quite a long time since I'd seen anyone face-to-face, -face, and the meeting went on for about an hour and a half, two hours, and we all found ourselves for about the next 45 minutes kind of sitting around going so the meetings ended anyway but yeah just kept on talking and you honestly just kind of realized that actually being in the same room as other people is nice you know and, and you do miss it and even though i had been perfectly happy working from home and i have my, my wife my two kids my dog my parrot i have lots of people going on in a very very small house and it's it's it's, it's rare that i actually get a room to myself for more than a few nights 
but you do you miss actually being face to face so you can understand it you know people really struggle with this and it's that difficult balance between people's mental health and physical health and the health of the entire economy which is really tough i, I mean i i appreciate that that the apathy will be lacking especially with christmas because there is that oh it, it's christmas and we've got to do christmas and therefore on the 11th we're going to go out shopping I, I'm I, I'm I'm just staying in the house. I'm not even going outside this weekend. I'm not doing, totally. it, you know. And unfortunately, I don't need to buy anything anymore. It's all done, you know. So anyway, I need, don't need to go out. But if we we're going out for a walk or something, that's what we normally do: we head off to Port Rush or Port Stewart and go for a walk. But even then, with shops, non-essential shops being closed, there's more people out on the street. So we're at the point of not even getting out of the car. Because it's like, now it's too many people. I'm not risking that. You know, because I don't know anybody here. You know, so it's, yeah, it's it's been incredibly difficult. Even for me working from home for so long, it has been hard. At the same time, yes, I think media outlets really miss the trick. You know, it, you needed that kind of Hans Roslin sort of, this is how it is, storytelling. And if you had that... I think a lot more people would have taken a lot more notice. See, there's an interesting problem there, which is of the pandemics that we have knowledge of or good data for at the scale of this, so much has changed that then you can undercut the modeling at every point. You basically go, oh, Spanish flu didn't have airplanes. Oh, right, okay. You know, you know what? SARS didn't make out of didn't make it out of East of the Far East. Foot and mouth didn't make it or wasn't aerosolized, so don't worry about it. Kreuzfeld, so prion disease, so not going to be in anywhere, anywhere near the same thing. It's completely different scenario, so you can't apply. Now, the difficulty is that the models, or sorry, to be fair, the structure of the models that can be applied to model, ugh, it's too many words, to model that kind of infection curve, the 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 algorithms involved are exactly the same you just change the coefficients you change what you know uh, how risky is breath versus sharing dildos you know right but the, the 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 but the science is the same the the to do a plug the data science is the same the the way that you manipulate the time series observations to then predict future events yeah, is the same. But the problem is that the regular layman treats those as as soon as you can have any kind of critique of any comparison of a thing, they go, oh, they must know nothing. This must be a completely different thing that needs to be built up from the ground up. And we can't use anything that we've ever done before. You're starting to see the same narrative going around the, was it the mRNA vaccination, that this is a new thing. Oh, it's yeah. reprogramming your genes. And I'm going, yeah, that's kind of what viruses do. So fine. And hello, cancer. That's basically literally your cells living long enough to forget how to make other cells. Interestingly, the one thing that I wish would have happened is the BBC. I don't think the BBC repeated that Hannah Fry documentary on, con on Contagion. Because mm. it was brilliant and it was so, this is how it is. And it was kind of a bit like track and trace anyway. It was like, if you got too close, you might have infected someone. Did it happen? Did it not happen? And then they'd show up red if they were infected and they would go and walk somewhere else and yeah, you know, all that. And that, that just sort of illustrated it perfectly. And it's like, well, why isn't this being repeated on BBC One primetime? Because then they worked out that the track and trace system was completely fucked. Oh, but I mean, the, the thing for that documentary was just built as a as a thing anyway. Yeah, um, but unfortunately, people expect that to be what actually happens, especially whenever it comes from the BBC. They then they then see the BBC as the pro proverbial mouthpiece of the government one way or another, which is depressing in its own way. Then go, oh, so that's what the government mean whenever they say track and trace. I, I agree, it was a fantastic explainer. Unfortunately, it sort of sits in this kind of strange, I don't know, a, there must be another a policy version of the uncanny valley where it's close enough to what the government should be doing that they don't want to show it to anyone. 
Mm. Yeah. Obviously, the next the next four. When you mention around the whole modeling thing, I assume, I assume you guys both know three blue, one brown. Yeah. YouTube dude, Grant Sanderson, I think his name is. If we have any viewers, and if anyone is still listening at this point, I would normally do a share screen thing, but I have a new computer and it's not set up and it somehow doesn't work with permissions. But it's worth looking at the three blue one. They did a really good explainer video on sort of SIR models and how all that stuff works. And it's for anyone who doesn't know anything about epidemiology and how viruses spread, it's honestly one of the best things I've ever seen to explain that. I mean, most of right. Grant's videos are the same for explaining. Ah, good. Some Andrew's going to show it. They have, he has one in there around SIR models. And honestly, it's just brilliant. And in fact, I have, I wish I had more time to watch YouTube videos and I would watch more of his because my kids don't like watching them and I have to watch Sniper Wolf and Azimand. But yeah, there's some just phenomenal stuff in there. And the, the, the right. only SIR models is just genuinely brilliant. It explains the whole thing so clearly. And even it's that simulating an epidemic one just over the right hand side down a bit. Yeah, that one. So oh. so I was just sitting there holding in a cough, trying to work out where on earth, whenever I was sharing the video, where the mute button went. So yeah, apologies <laughs> for the random yeah. I was going to say that three blue, one brown. Top right. Is Top right. Simulating an epidemic. That's the one. Top right. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this guy's been doing a few of these. So covering COVID for a while and actually had a couple of update ones. But the other one I would throw in is if anyone is trying to understand how numbers manipulate other numbers, Three Blue One Brown is absolutely fantastic. Also does the puzzle series, which are quite fun. I don't know whether he's been doing them recently, but does deep dives into thought experiments and geometry puzzles you know trying to work out uh, more how to think about a problem rather than just here's the answer congratulations so mm -hmm. we're we're almost bringing that back full circle to the education angle but yeah and wh while we're doing pitches for other people's material i actually did a course a while ago it was the i think i think it was on coursera i can't remember but it was a stanford lecture doing an introduction to mathematical thinking and again, similar thing to what we do, what Grant Sanderson does, it's that idea of I'm not telling you the answers and showing you equations, I'm telling you how to think about things differently. And again, it, I find it really educational because I, I only did maths up to GCSE. And at that point, you're learning how to solve simple, basic equations. And you don't realize that there's an entire way of thinking around this that actually can transform the way that you look at the world, honestly, you know. Yeah, and that's something I'm trying to do more of myself. So I, I bought this when I was in St. Andrews. It's wonderful. I love this book. It's time. Time's my problem, as usual. Yeah. But I need to read more, which I'm going to do over Christmas, because I'm not celebrating Christmas. What was that? The Mathematics Lovers Companion? Companion. Yeah. Edward Shainman. Awesome. I will order it right now. Right, folks, we are two hours in. I think that's probably a good point to call it a night. Because my, my wine glass is empty. There's my teacup. Amateurs. No, but <laughs> I, I think we're good. I'm just trying to think if there's anything that we needed to touch on before the end. So, Austin, do you remember the URL for AICon? Because I got so confused trying to find it. I got lost and found it another conference. AICon. Com? Yeah, AICon2020.com. Oh, it, it, actually, a nice and simple because we got very confused whenever we were looking at the animation because all of the specifications for when it was deliverable was by this conference, and the conference didn't have a website at that point. So we Googled it and we thought it was the 19th of December, and we thought, fantastic, we've got loads of time. Oh, time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. So for a shameless plug, I don't know what way this works. I, if anyone is watching this and wants to follow me on Twitter, it's Austin Tani, at Austin Tani, A-U-S-T-I-N-T-A-N-N-E-Y. And if we will be taking all the content from AI Con and putting it on YouTube, if you're registered, you can go back and watch it in, on replay, but we will be pushing the whole thing out on YouTube and I'll be sharing that when it comes out on Twitter because I'm super happy with some of my content anyway. And you got anything you want to sneak in and plug? No, the comp, the comp. <laughs> by, by Jason's book.
<laughs> no, hold on. Is there not a second edition coming out soon? So maybe we need to hold off. No, that is the second edition that you got. Okay. Well, that, it, it's spot the fucker who hasn't cracked the spine on it yet. You know what? I have to apologize. I haven't bought it yet, and I will do so. <laughs> I, I will go on to it right now. No, you, you should use your smile.amazon link so that you can then donate to Farset while you're doing it. So, well, I think the main thing to keep in mind uh, is I will do that. I mean, I mean, obviously, the copies that you have are rare because they're not signed. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. I don't, I don't like plugging my own stuff. I'm really touchy about doing it. I'm, I am useless at this kind of thing, you know. It's all right when it's in in front of an audience and there's a slide that says, "Yeah, I did that." Yeah, that's fine. No, I use that thing. Yeah. No, I hate doing that. <laughs> so, but oh, anything to say? No, no. Be safe, because just be safe and you know, be good. If everyone, anyone, everyone, everyone seems to like follow Friday. <laughs> yeah, if just, anyone. Is I, honestly, just that's the only reason I know it's the weekend. Yeah, me too. This does a follow Friday on Twitter, and it's literally all of us are super happy to go. Oh shit! It's Friday, and also yes, hi. And, and then I, re I then I realised that Christmas Day is on a Friday, so that's going to be that's yes. going to be a fun yeah, yeah. That'll be nice. You can remind us it's Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> well, listen, we're gonna we're gonna have to do like a, 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 a Christmas session where you know we we get drunk at around about three o'clock in the afternoon, and then just talk about bullshit. Now the problem is. I'm drinking tea on purpose. <laughs> the Bushmills is in the kitchen. The last time I drank, no, I'm not doing that. Three o'clock in the afternoon. I got episode I zero drink. for that one. Do it over Christmas, it'll be fine. <laughs> Three o'clock in the afternoon, no. All right, well, we're at half past the hour, so we'll wrap things up. It's good to see everybody. We will kill the recording, because that's the important bit. So see you next time on whatever the fuck we're calling this. Data delinquents? Data something. Yeah. Let, let's, let's call this one AI Ethics is the new social media guru. Yeah. Like it. Good. Sounds good. See you next time, folks. <laughs>